Thanks for coming to the creatives before and after the show. Um, we've got an amazing panel with some really amazing creators. So how about Everett, you want to start off with your introduction? Yeah. Uh, sure. Man, I'm just going right in there. Hi. Uh, I'm Everett Downing. I am the creator and showrunner of uh, My Dad the Bounty Hunter. I've uh, been around for a long time and <laughs> excited. Excited for this. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> I'm Jeremiah Cortez. I created A Dogs in Space on Netflix. <laughs> My name's Adam Jeffco, and I co created Nico and the Sword of Light. Uh, my name is Jim Bryson, and I also co-created Nikon <laughs> Uh I'm Jorge, uh, El Tigre, Book of Life, and most recently, Maya Le Three. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Clearly the man you've come to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this panel will be before and after, right? So let's talk about the before stages. Um, how... What was the original idea for each of your stories for what brought brought to, uh, brought to life in terms of pitching it? You know, what was that core bean sprout of an idea? Um, the original bean sprout came from, um, you know, I was working on uh, a movie at Sony. I was boarding, storyboarding, on uh, a very um, popular film. Um, I think you guys have all heard of it, the Mojo movie. And, um, <laughs> the Emoji movie? The Emoji movie. <laughs> and, uh, oh. you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a delayed reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, that's where I, I came in contact with my, um, mm -hmm. My co-partner, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, Pat Harpin, and we just, uh, he's awesome, he's a super smart guy. Uh, we got together and we were just kind of banting around ideas like, what would we want to do? Um, and we just kind of like started circling around things that we loved, like we loved like science fiction, we run, wanted to tell stories about family, we wanted to tell stories about a dad, and a dad that wasn't a knucklehead, you know, a dad that actually like loved his family and, and didn't screw up all the time. Um, and, you know, I, I know at the time I was, like, working a lot, so I didn't see my kids a lot. Mm. And uh, I kind of wanted to write a story. It's kind of a love letter to, to my family because so, I wanted to write something um, for my daughters just to, to know that I, I love them and appreciate them and, you know, kind of reflect the struggles that I, I had being a dad and working in an industry that, like, you know, works you really hard and you don't get to see kids so much. So awesome. uh, we kind of, that's how we kind of came great. up with the idea. So, Sharing that. Yeah. Jeremiah? Yeah, for me, it was a really odd thing. To me, I feel like the show created itself in a way. Mm. Um, it was just a sketchbook comic idea when I first started it, or when I first started doing it. And it was very much, I had garbage, chonies, and loaf. And those were the only three characters that were in existence. And it was very much them just going on adventures. And it was more of just a story exercise for me of like not getting bogged down in story structure or really trying to figure out a plot or anything. So it was just panel to panel. Whatever the last person said kind of dictated mm -hmm. what would happen next. Um, and that was during school. And it was very much peers read it, family read it, and my coworkers read it. And it's because people kept asking for more pages that I kept writing it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think I would have stopped after like five pages. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, it just kind of kept growing. And then I started doing little animated clips. People got excited thinking I was doing something for real with it. And then it was like, uh, I had peers wanting to jump on, like, hey, can we help out? And it was like, okay, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> there was no plot. And I was like, okay, well, I'll do a trailer, like a commercial trailer. So I need a plot. Okay, let me write a script. Okay, you guys do this. People came in to do uh, voiceovers and stuff like that. And from there, it was very much, well, I think I could pitch this as a show. And then working on the Pitch Bible for about two, two and a half years or so. Mm -hmm. And then pitched it to Netflix, and, and it just kept going. Wow. You know? That's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, mine, mine and Jim's story, we... we um, we were pitching for about three years, I think, mm -hmm. like, and, and, you know, going into all these meetings with Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and stuff, and be like, yeah, we've got this amazing idea. 
And like it was always met with it. Nah, this one's not really for us. So we, we were, after about 25 of these rejections, we were getting pretty bummed out because uh, we felt like we had good ideas, but it was almost like we couldn't convince our our imagination, our idea to these people like effectively. And um, at the same time, we uh, reconnected with Bobby and Kay, who I'm sure you guys probably heard of, <laughs> who created this expo. And um, and uh, they were in the same position as us. They had done a bunch of like uh, concept art for movies like Alice in Wonderland, but at the same time, they wanted to do, do their own thing, right? So me and Jim were like, yeah, we want to do our own stuff too. We want to like, you know, wh why are we going to these kind of exec gatekeepers like and asking for permission to make something when we felt like we wanted to just, you know, do our own thing. So between the four of us, we sat around, hit a couple of vapes, and we're like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> it'd be cool to do, like, um, an uh, interactive storybook. And um, so we started working on, like, concepts for that. And we, so, uh, yeah, I'll just jump in, because yeah, it's going to be repetitive. Yeah. Um, basically, the way we made it was originally we were going to make a um, choose-your-own-adventure comic. And we're like, that's so cool, because when we were kids, we were like, we love choose-your-own-adventure. So we had this big whiteboard. I remember every week we would cram this whiteboard into my car, and we had all the different possibilities. <clears throat> and we ended up realizing, like, <laughs> we, there's no way we could do a choose your yeah, adventure we, we, animated comic. We scheduled it out. This was going to take years, right? So like, <laughs> yeah. we distilled it down to just, like, let's just animate a comic and put it on the iPad, right? Because when the iPad first came out, it was like, cool, you can press the panels, you can, like, see it come to life and, and Bobby was like you know that was always a dream of mine to like imagine my comics came to life so that was like our, our angle um, we, we did a Kickstarter uh, we, we wrote off Bobby's like mad follow account for like you know <laughs> like raised a bunch of money and um, for two years we worked our asses off we got a cool little team together of like uh, indie animators and stuff and um, we put together a 55 page animated comic put it on the app store and it just nothing happened and we're like <laughs> shit but then, uh, and then Bobby gets an email from Apple, like from Steve Jobs. No, it was it was from Apple, <laughs> and he was like, they were like, oh, we really like we really like the look of this this you know this comic. Is like, uh, have you guys ha you know had much um, you know success with it? And like, and, and th they said we recommend you update it now and send us some uh, promotional artwork. We're like, that's strange. Okay, so we did that. Next day, it got featured and it hit number one on the bookstore and oh. got like all this like crazy attention and um, and including the attention from Amazon. Yeah, Jeff Bezos came into my house. He's like, <laughs> hey, make a show. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, sorry, Jeff, we're busy. Yeah, no, yeah. But, but yeah, basically, Jobs is here. Came yeah. right from yeah. space. Yeah, yeah. Beams yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. No, but literally, the the irony is that having trying to pitch shows for three years and like getting all these like no's. Within two weeks of Amazon coming to us, we were signing on the on the dotted line. So, it uh, the big lesson for us was, if make you want to make a show, just make something. You know, don't always keep ideas in your head. That was our big lesson. We wanted to share with you guys. <laughs> so, uh, so the way the way Maya happened is kind of crazy. I don't know if this will ever happen again in our industry, but there was a magic moment in 2018 where Netflix was like a drunk billionaire. <laughs> yeah. And he just invited you to his house and you would pitch him a show and he would green light it. <laughs> and so I got invited to this crazy pizza party with a ton of creators and a, it, it was like Illuminati-esque, right? <laughs> like a ton of creators and, and like directors. And the old guard, I have to admit, the old guard was very skeptical. They're like, who are these guys saying they're going to do stuff? And then people like me were like, well, even if this doesn't work, we should have a great time at this fucking party. <laughs> <laughs> so it was my birthday, and my wife was already pissed that I went to that instead of celebrating it with her. And I kept telling her, like, I have so many other birthdays, but rich Netflix uncle, this is the one. <laughs> so we go to this party, there's tequila, I drink a ton of tequila, and then the most incredible thing in the universe happens. They sit me down, right, with like an empty bottle, and, and they go, Jorge, pitch us a show that you don't think, this is the magic, you don't think you can get made anywhere. And I was like, 
<laughs> like cut to the tombstones of my family over Mexico shaking <laughs> and like <laughs> like their spirits travel you know they cross the border with no visas <laughs> and they come into my body and, and I go I'm a make a brown people Lord of the Rings about a princess and you know spoiler alert and she's gonna fucking die at the end because that's Mexican women they die for us <laughs> and <laughs> so somewhere at Sunset Boulevard, the Netflix algorithm, which I believe is like a 12 year old girl in a pool of blood, <laughs> went, <laughs> let's make that. <laughs> and they greenlit it that literally that moment. So I drove home, I got a call from my reps, and they were like, what the fuck did you tell them? <laughs> and so the show got greenlit. I got super skeptical, and I. so what I ended up doing was I wrote the script, and I, we designed the characters, and we had the characters modeled. And on my first day, because I specifically asked, I want to start on Cinco de Mayo, right? I got to stay on brand. <laughs> Turn, <laughs> turns out it was a Saturday. So the following Monday, I showed up with a script and my characters already modeled, wow. and I said, read the script, look at the models. If you don't like the script and you don't like the models, I won't work here. Uh -huh. If you like the script, then you buy it. And you like the models, the show is visually developed. <laughs> so I will always bet on me. The, the thing that I learned over the years is the moment they spend money on things, you owe them the money if you want to take it somewhere else. Right. So mm -hmm. now I spend my own money, and it's better for everybody. And I save everybody headaches, and I save blood for everybody. So. Never, it will never happen like that for me again, but that's how Maya got made. Nice. Wow, that's amazing. Was your wife like cool? Was, what? Was your wife happy afterwards that you left? My wife was, was like, very, she didn't believe it for a long time. <laughs> like other people had to tell her. Yeah, I remember hearing about that legendary party. It's insane. Um, okay, so now we've talked about the before. So what was the biggest learning surprise running a show? Or especially for you, like Jorge, doing that big limited event series? The, the biggest lesson for, at least for me, was having made a TV show, El Tigre, and then Book of Life, I honestly thought, well, this can't be harder. Like, this cannot be harder than those two things. It was just as hard in completely different ways. And the biggest lesson was, if it's a limited series, you need to get to the end to know where to start. Mm -hmm. And you run out of money. So you have to be really smart about where the money goes, and you have to be really, really smart about being realistic about making a show that's producible with your budget. Mm. Because obviously as artists, we all, our expectations and our dreams are gonna exceed our, our ambition will always exceed our budget. But by how much is what, to me, separates the good guys and the bad guys. Mm. There's nothing worse than a creator who wants to make Akira with the budget of Mucha Lucha. Like, you can't do those things. And you will murder your crew. You will murder your artist. You probably will ruin your life. And then what? So one of the biggest lessons to me was, I want to still be friends with everybody after the show is done. I want to live with myself after the show is done. I believe that show running reveals character. Mm -hmm. It really reveals who you are, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a crazy psychopath, guess what? It's going to be very obvious to everybody right away. So thinking long term, thinking about other creators, what happens to creators after their show was a big deal to me. Mm -hmm. And what happens to creators who made horrible, horrible shows for horrible, horrible ways, and then they become successful, they get more shows. So the ends will justify the means yeah. in the eyes of Hollywood. That can't work for humanity, yeah. right? If the cost of making things, how can we make cartoons and movies about families and people being together when behind the scenes we're destroying lives? <laughs> so it can't be that. So that was the, that was the big lesson. And especially for, for us at that time, it was definitely how do we work with diverse people from different places, but also how do we work with people who 
you usually are not allowed to be a part of this and who have a different point of view and how do we listen to everybody and incorporate it in a way for the good of the show. Because mm. it can't just be, in my opinion, it can't just be virtue over entertainment, mm. which tends to happen a lot when things start getting preachy. So how do you make those two things balance? And then as a creator, you work with a crew. So how do you step back and enable people to help you make the thing in a way where you help them invest mm -hmm. into the show emotionally and artistically? So that that's the, the Rubik's Cube to me. That's great. Let's get down the line. Um, yeah, for me, it was about like learning how to give notes <laughs> and not give too many notes and learning when not to give notes mm. and not to be a pain in the ass, yeah. which was not something anyone wants to be. But I think like when you, when you have this thing that you're trying to make and you're trying to make something different and you're trying to make it in a certain way how you see it, it's hard to get you know, 300 people who most of which you've never met mm -hmm. on the same kind of page. Mm. So I think like for me it was sort of like, all right, if I'm going to give notes to people, I'm going to be like the first guy in and the last guy to leave kind of thing. Like I'm going to make sure I'm like putting in the hours so I'm not just like do this, do that, do this, do that. See you later. I'm at the bar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what kind you of what happened. Yeah, no, yeah, it's the same. Yeah, I, sh I share your guys' opinion for sure. It's um, a big thing for me was about letting go as well. I think, you know, when you. When you create a show, obviously that's your baby and you care so much about it, but you make the mistake of becoming blindsided. And when we essentially got put with, um, you know, Tipmas Studios in LA who were, produce, who were producing Nico, we were like, wanted to control everything, you know, not because we wanted to control, but we felt like we needed to kind of, you know, have a say in everything in order for the show, it to be the show we needed to make. And it, it just caused, like you say, it caused problems. It caused like backlash. We were conflicting with people and I didn't, that wasn't a nice, way to work. It was like, you know, you want to create a creative environment where people feel like they're putting in their stuff. And so I had to almost like at some point step back and be like, all right, I'm not Brad Bird yet. You know, I, I shouldn't be like trying to take over this whole thing. And um, and then then it really there was a harmony that, that became created. Like we built a relationship with the writer instead of clashing horns with the writer. We built a relationship with the team. And when they started throwing in their ideas, it only made the show better, right? It like, was way better. Yeah, it was like, and also, who are we to think we knew more than people who had worked in the industry for 20 years, right? Like, we would, this is our first show. So that was the big lesson for me. Like, pick your battles and know where you want to, you know, try and control something. If it's integrity, it's integrity at stake. You don't want to, like, lose it and for it to become something else. But at the same time, you have to let your crew shine. Because, like you say, at the end of the day, they're going to do their best work like that. But, yeah. That's it. Yeah, for me it was almost identical types of situations. Um, as far as what I found worked very well was, and this was my intent going into it, was to empower my, my, my crew. Um, there was a lot of the story elements that I would purposely leave blank just so the writers had opportunities to fill in those blanks, uh, for the storyboard team to fill in those blanks. Um, a lot of characters. There was a couple dogs where I, I, they weren't my creations. They were very much the writers came up with. I was like, yeah, I like them. Um, very much uh, like uh, James Hamilton was our head writer. He came up with this dog, Barclay, in season two. And, you know, for me, it was very much, I want everybody on this show to feel ownership. I want them to feel like this is their show as much as it is mine. And for me, it was very much, okay, he wrote Barclay. He's a fun character, reading the script. Um, I'm like, well, we don't have a character drawn out for him. So I went to him and said, what, do you, what kind of dog do you want? What breed do you want? Um, what kind of clothes do you want him to wear? And I personally drew, you know, several different variations of that character and showed it to him and waited for his approval, you know. And that was the head writer. He had nothing to do with character design. But for me, that was just my way of including him and making him feel like, you know, uh, that sense of ownership. And I did that with everybody I possibly could on the show. Um, so that's, you know, where I was. I wanted to make sure everybody felt included. Um, Note-wise, it was very much just giving what I thought needed to be said. Um, 
And if I got pushback from either a storyboard artist or the writers or the music, anybody, it was very much, okay, um, you know, why? What's the bump? And we'd figure out that compromise. Um, people were encouraged to tell me no, and I'd be like, okay, cool. You know, if you want to do it your way, we'll do that. Um, the only time I ever really, you know, put my foot down was when, you know, my mindset was that, you know, whatever their jobs are, you know, do it to your best, uh, you know, push back if you need to. Who am I to say anything about storyboards? I'm not a storyboard artist who's been doing this for several years. Uh, I'm not the head writer. Uh, so it's very much, if you, you want to argue a, a note, let's do it. Um, but for me, it was very much, my only job is to make sure that I deliver the show Netflix bought. Hmm. Um, and if we're, if a character design or a script or an episode is going in a path that I don't think is what they bought, then, you know, that's when I really put the, um, you know, my feet in the floor and really just hold my ground. Um, but other than that, it, it worked out pretty damn well, um, letting everybody just have that, that sense of ownership in the show. That's great. Um, when it came to dad, uh, I think the thing that surprised me the most is uh, how many things actually worked out. So hear me out here. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go into these things, I'm a first time showrunner, right? Like going into things, you just have a lot of theories, right? You have a lot of theories, like there, there's not a class that they teach on like show running. Like there's nobody you can really talk to. All you can do is kind of pull the people that you trust. Like I relied on this guy heavily. Like I worked on mine. I, was came, I came right off his production. And a lot of times I would just spend, like I would ask him questions. I watched the way he runs a production. And you know, I don't know if you guys can guess, I'm not a spring chicken. I've been doing this for a while. And I, I've just been doing that for most of my career. Like just making notes like, oh man, like, that director was kind of a tyrant, and this is what happened. I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, man, I love the way that this guy did this. Oh, that, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm going to try that. So when I came to, to, to my show, it's just like me and my partner, we just had a bunch of theories. We just collected the stuff that we, and we're like, this is how we kind of want to run our show. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens. And I was kind of shocked by, like, how, like, a lot of things worked out. Now, there were some things that definitely surprised you, like, the things that you don't know about are things like notes. You don't get a lot of swings at that, and that's mm. going to be kind of shocking. But because we had so many other things, like, oh, giving people freedom to, like, always being respectful, having transparency, like, keeping people in the loop, like, um, treasuring talent and, like, treating them like, you know, we all just want to be treated like human beings, right? All that just made like a lot of the the you know the bumps that much easier, you know what I mean? So were there were there like things that kind of sprang up and surprised you? Yeah, but because we had kind of all these things in place, it really kind of made made it a lot smoother um, than I think um, it would have been if we kind of went in blind. Like if I didn't ask anybody like any questions, I would have been like a hot mess. It would have been a it would have been a train wreck. So. Um, I'm just really grateful for like, you know, the time I spent in Maya and like talking to this guy and all, all these other productions and just pay attention. Like if there's anything I can tell you guys, pay attention to these productions you're working on, make a note of like what works or what doesn't work, what makes you feel good, right? Like I want my crew to feel this way. Like Jorge would like bring us into these great meetings and like make us feel really like, like we're part of the group. I'm like, oh, I want this feeling. And like, you know, when, whenever I run my show. So, um, yeah. So okay. like, All of you are approving creators. Um, after the show has done, what are the next steps for the next project? What would you do differently? Wait, wait, what, wait, would you, what would you do differently for the next project to, in terms of getting that pitch going and selling it? So I, I, this was a terrible advice. Good advice I was given and I terribly didn't follow it, which was you need to come up with your new thing before your thing ends. Uh, so for example, in Book of Life, Guillermo del Toro, said, hey, you know how tired you are? You, you feel you're going to die? Now's the time to come up with <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and I didn't listen to him. And what happens is when you, especially in a movie, when you're promoting, you get asked, what's your next thing? And the worst thing you can say is, I don't know. <laughs> you're supposed to plant that seed. Yeah. And I didn't do that. Mm. Uh, so for Maya, right before Maya ended, 
I was pitching like crazy and I was super tired, but it worked <laughs> because right before your thing comes out, and we and me and I ever talk about this, like the months before your thing comes out is magic because your thing could be the next SpongeBob. It could be the next mm -hmm. Avatar, the next, like it could be the greatest thing ever made. So everybody's going, is he the one or are they the one, right? And that's when lots of stuff gets optioned. So that's the biggest lesson I learned, and I did that on Maya, and it totally worked. <laughs> uh, and, and this idea, this is a horrible thing to say, but as important as the show is, you are more important than the show. So when you're selling the show and you're promoting the show, you need to sell you because you're not a one-trick pony. Mm. This is just one of the dishes that will come from your restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and a restaurant cannot survive on one dish. It's great. Yeah. That's it, so. Um, so uh, last time we were here, here in person was, I think it was 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we, I think we we gave a talk where he basically said like we're done with pitching we're just gonna like make stuff now yeah. and then we went on for like the next year and just only did pitching. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, wait, so, so with Nico, like, yes, it was good advice for what you say, Jorge. Like we uh, we we were planning on that. We were like started to come up with an idea for our next show, and then but then to cut a long story short, whoever was in charge of Amazon at the time uh, when we were in our second season apparently screwed up and spent all the budget. So he got fired, they brought someone else in, and his way to take care of that was to take all the money from animation and put it in live action, and they closed the kids' original. So Nico got cancelled from, even, even it got dropped from 13 episodes to 10, and we had to like finish the show early. So we were like, suddenly we were like, oh my god, like the show's finishing and we haven't like planned mm -hmm. anything out. But we, we, we naively thought, oh, it's, it's cool, we, we've won an Emmy, we've like made this show, we'll be able to sell another show, no problem. So we took a year off and we just worked on a new show, this new sci-fi idea we'd come up with. And we were like, yeah, it's, you know, Netflix will probably pick it up. We like, and, and we, we got a meeting, you know, they liked it, but then we didn't hear back. And, and that yeah. dragged out into like two years then three years. And funnily enough, that show uh, that we wrote back in 2017, we just sold it Woo. last week. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that, that, <laughs> Thanks. But that's the lesson, right? It's like that. It took us even with a show behind our belt. It still took us five and a half years to sell another well, we show. Well, we I think we we came up with five separate ideas. We started with the first one. We were like, "This is definitely going to sell." Nothing. Second one, third one, fourth one. But along the way, we basically we Learn we learned so much because we started collaborating with different people, writers, development executives, <coughs> uh, producers, and just learning as much as we could. And much and so it just ended up that the first one we came up with is the one yeah. we sold. So patience, yeah. patience, <laughs> must learn <laughs> patience. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what now after the <laughs> what show? Would you do differently for oh. this? What would I do differently on the next one? Um, I kind of liked how it went. I honestly had a good experience. Um, even like the hard times, like, um, you know, me and the head writer, we bumped heads quite a bit. But it was very much because he was just as passionate about the characters and their development than I was. Mm. Um, so we would, we, would have, we would have battles um, a lot of the time. And it was very much, that was him and me, like... We didn't we didn't do that with the writer with the writing um, the writers room. Um, I tried to keep that between us as much as I could. Like, okay, I'll deal with this. I'll I'll deal with this little this little hiccup. But even that I would keep because it wasn't so much that I was fighting somebody who was like dragging his feet, you know, and and screaming on top of his lungs. It was very much I was I was combating against somebody who was just as passionate about the story that, as I was. And even that came out great. We came out with some great stories, um, you know, developing Kira's arc in that season one, and then just having every character have their own little moment in season two. Um, you know, that, that was a combined effort between, you know, everybody on the crew, but between, you know, the arguments that I would have with James. And yeah, I mean, even that, I would keep. So well, I wouldn't really do anything different. Sorry, I meant like um, now that you're a proofing creator, what would you do differently the second time around to sell your next show? What would I do to sell it? Yeah. 
Hmm. Because um. <laughs> you did like a snowball effect. Didn't it? I did a snowball effect. Now, oh, that's funny. Uh, uh, snowball. You said snowball. Um, it has some, that's like the theme of the second one. But um, right now, I guess to Jorge's point, it's very much there was me working on some kind of a pitch during the second season. Mm. And it was. Like, even in the dog's office, there was drawings up on the whiteboard of all these new characters from a different idea I was popping up with. Um, and so, yeah, right now it's done. It's being pitched around for the last month or so. So we'll see what happens with that. And since that pitch Bible is now completed, right now I'm working on a pitch for a, a feature. Mm -hmm. So currently writing that and pitching this uh, series around. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm I, I'm in I'm in a pretty fortunate situation because I I've, I've been able to kind of like before the sh my show was out I've been able to kind of roll on to something. But you know, I've got another hot take for you guys. <laughs> you know, um, in this industry, you, you know, you're in it for the long haul. I would really suggest you guys get to know like get friendly with everybody that you work with and like mm. sure that seems simple that might seem like easy but like i really do enjoy spending time with the executive that that greenlit my show i think she's great i'm going to maintain that relationship you know what i mean i want to maintain a great relationship with the studio that i worked with before um if someone suggests like hey meet this person i'm going to meet him you know like hey this person from henson wants to meet you sure because i want to meet people i want to like them so like when my thing wraps up or when it actually, you know, I, again, like Jorge, I'm not going to wait until it's done. I'm going to be like, okay, put the hat on. Let's go out and sell this thing before you ha you kind of have to do that. Um, but hopefully along the way, you've actually like, you know, made a good impression on everybody around you. They enjoy working with you and you're really eager to work with you again. And you find that that actually makes it like a lot easier mm -hmm. like when you pitch something, especially if you deliver a successful show. If you deliver a successful show, the crew likes you, everyone enjoyed working with you, the executives enjoy working with you. I, don't, I mean, like, how could you not get another show, right? Like, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of like my philosophy. Mm. All right, here's a fun one. Uh, most memorable moment of your first show creating during that production? That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll start this one off. One of, one of, I mean, there's a, like a lot of really crazy, surreal stuff. Like, you know, I think um, it's not one particular moment, but like it's just like a lot of like small moments like that are similar. So like. For me, it was like just recording like the talent, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we got like a really an amazing cast, uh, and being able to like write this, write something, and then like hand it off to like these amazing actors, like like on our show, like you know, starring Laz Alonzo who plays Mother's Milk in 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 The Boys, you know, Yvonne Orji from Insecure, you know, Priya Ferguson who's Erica from like uh, you know Stranger Things, like. Seeing that and like seeing these guys kind of take those those roles and like read for it and like breathe life into it, like that's so fucking cool, man. Like it's awesome, man. Like I remember like Rob Rob Riggle is, is doing one of the voices. He's amazing. I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's awesome. And he's like this like ex special uh, special forces guy, and like you know seems kind of serious. And you see him, he's always playing like zany characters. But when you see him, it's like ah uh, ah. Uh. Uh, we're, like, we're kind of giving him like this feedback, like, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and then he'll go and he'll just be like, "What do you mean?" And you're like, "Oh my god, where does this come from?" Like, that is like, it's it's just amazing. That's like, it's and it's cool to interact with them and have them say like, "Oh man, I'm really enjoying this character." Like, it's it's just awesome. It's cool. Yeah, for me it was. Um, I don't want to downplay any element or moment in in the whole experience because it was a great experience all the way around. I'm very thankful. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to think of like those surreal moments. And for me it was, um, cause Dogs in Space is kind of a, a, a love letter in some ways to Frasier and Star Trek. Mm. It's basically what Dogs in Space is. <laughs> it's Frasier in Space. Um, <laughs> 
And for me, it was, you know, I didn't know much about dog breeds. I knew I wanted to have dog breeds in there and their personalities shine through. And I knew I wanted to do sci-fi. Um, but when I was doing the comic, it was just these dogs going to a planet and they got stranded and X, Y, Z started to happen. Um, when it came to pitching this thing and writing the pitch Bible, I was like, I don't know anything about dog breeds. And I don't know anything, I don't know much about sci-fi. So I'm kind of in a weird, funky spot. How am I going to do this? So I watched all of the original Star Trek. I watched Next Generation. And, you know, that was, that's grueling. That's hard marathon. Because <laughs> that's like, I don't know, like 27 episodes a season or yeah. something like that. And every season, you, or every episode, you could cut out maybe 20 minutes. Yeah. And it'll still be a good episode. Um, <laughs> So I really grew to love Star Trek after doing all that. And to then go into the production of it all, and then to have um, Michael Dorn uh, do a voice and, and um, Kate Mulgrew coming on as well. Like getting these characters that were from Star Trek on the show to do character voices, that was surreal. Yeah. To see them come in and put on these voices, or Kate, Kate Mulgrew was just her, and she nailed it. Like, we didn't give her any notes. She came in, did her lines, one take, and we're like, oh, that was the fastest record ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, having, having um, the Star Trek cast come on yeah. to the show was, was pretty surreal. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, for me it was it, the whole experience of like working on uh, Nico was was kind of in a way kind of lonely because I was in the UK and me and Jim were remote, uh, I guess, show running from like to the studio in LA. So it was an amazing experience and by far one of the best gigs we've ever had. Like, it's so so grateful. But at the same time, you know, you are kind of cut off. Like, you're not feeling that like physical studio vibe with the the crew and everything. And so I think season one took best part of a year and a half. And uh, just me basically in my little studio at home, like having the, you know, the Zoom meetings and stuff, but just like working away and, you know, checking scripts and all that kind of stuff, but never really feeling like properly a part of the production, right? Like you get the, the little like camaraderie in the Zoom calls and stuff. Um, but then, but just before the show was coming out was uh, San Diego Comic-Con. And so Amazon were like, yeah, we're going to fly you guys out. We're going to like do this big event. It's going to be great. And the whole experience was just insane because it went, I went from that, like basic city on my own, to like flying out to Comic-Con. We met with Jim and Bobby and Kay. And they were like, right, just be outside your hotel at 2 p.m. We didn't know what to expect, right? So we we're outside the hotel, all dressed up, looking like fancy and stuff. And then all of a sudden, this big black van just pulls up and these like big Russian dudes all dressed in black grabbed us <laughs> and threw us in the van they're like go 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 and you're we're, like driving around these back streets we pull up at this warehouse and they open this big door and we're like what the hell's going on are we gonna get like executed or something and like they, they, they take us through the kitchen like in the movies you know like you're going through the kitchen like dodging all these people cutting food and stuff and then and then we get in this elevator and there's another guy in there like come on come in push us in and then we come up and the door opens and all these people are like there just waiting like all this press and they're like but it was, oh, who, was who are there? these guys? Who the, the first person we saw when the doors opened was SpongeBob. Oh, <laughs> Tom, uh, Kenny. Tom Kenny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the yeah, voices yeah. of yeah. one of the voices in the in the, he's yeah he did uh, yeah, he did the sidekick. <laughs> so he's the first. One. He's like, hey guys, let's go. <laughs> it's like uh, yeah. It was, sorry. No, he did do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna ask him. To after do a few that. drinks, he did. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Other but, people asked him to do that. Yeah, yeah. To listen. And then they just, it was just surreal. Like, so the, the reporters were expecting someone famous, maybe like Thor or something. And, <laughs> and like the door opened, it was just us. And they all just went, oh. Uh, and then so we just kind of walked past them and went, hi. And then we saw Kevin Smith and stuff. And it's like, and then who, who, there was a bunch of other famous people like, Kevin, what's up? We'll do lunch. And then like, we're just kind of walking through. And then, um, and then, and then we just like literally went into the screening and it had this huge room. They had like big, like, you know, projector on the wall. And they just basically screened like the pilot episode uh, with all, you know all these people in, and it literally brought tears to my eyes because it was like we were there with the crew, we got to meet everyone, we got to meet all the amazing voice talent, and like all that work that I'd basically been doing sitting on my own in my studio, like it was like right there on the screen. That was when it kind of really hit me. So, yeah, really, really awesome experience. I was very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my. You want to do that? I've sure. Covered it. All right. Uh, so my favorite LTG memory was, so, you know, Digger comes out, 
it, it gets canceled after one season, but it won seven Emmys. And to this day, Nick doesn't want to talk about that. <laughs> so I, we were heartbroken, right? To this day, my wife won't work with Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. I'm like, they, all those people have been fired. She's like, it's the principal. <laughs> <laughs> so cut to the uh, first time I pitched Book of Life to Guillermo del Toro. At that time, he, he had a house where he lived with his wife and two daughters, and he had this crazy, amazing museum house. So. D disastrous pitch. It was a terrible, terrible pitch. Uh, I, I was embarrassed and, 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 and basically I apologized to him at the end of the pitch because it, it was such a terrible pitch. And this is my hero. I'm li literally apologizing to one of my gods, right? So I'm like, yeah, well, I'm so sorry. And I, and I look at him you know, with beautiful eyes. And I'm like, please, <laughs> please, uh, I, I'm sorry I wasted your time. Thank you. And you know, I stand up to say goodbye. And he goes, Gordo, sit down. <laughs> and, and he goes, look, that wasn't a bad bitch. That was the shittiest word bitch. <laughs> Worst of all time. Take excrement and put poop and caca. That was your bitch. <laughs> so I'm like, OK, now he's, now, now he's like laying in. And he goes, but I know who you are. <laughs> I have two daughters. Every Saturday morning, we would watch El Tigre. I know your sense of humor, I know your art, and most importantly, I know how you see our culture. Mm. So even though El Tigre wasn't a hit, the right people saw it. Mm. And it was like, literally like, El Tigre showed up to save me. <laughs> <laughs> and Guillermo goes, of course I'm gonna produce your movie. Wow. If you made that with no support, I can't imagine what you're going to do with support. Wow, that's great. And that was it. Um, I'm curious if you guys have any questions for each other that you want to pick each other's brain. I think hot takes. What hot takes. Do you, yeah, yeah. Do, do you guys have any work? What? <laughs> do you guys have any work? <laughs> 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 what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, how about this? What do you, for that intermittent time of like three or four, two or three or four years of like pitching, how do you get through that time? Because that's like a lot of waiting, right? And just Yeah, like, the, the irony of pitching and development is there's no money, mm -hmm. right? Literally, there's no money in development. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are developing a show, it's like $10,000 or $20,000, and it can take two years. Mm -hmm. So you can't make a living doing development. Almost everybody has a full-time job, and they do their pilots on the side. Same with movies. You're working on multiple things. So this idea that you're rich in development doesn't exist. And that's why you hear people having multiple things in development, because you have the time, yeah. and you need money. So the, the big lesson, at least for me, early on was it's a marathon, right? If, if someone, again, I keep going back to Guillermo, but that's the example that I've had. If Guillermo has written 25 screenplays, but he's only made 10 movies, mm. that is reality. Not everything you pitch, as we know, mm -hmm. gets made. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. The idea is, if you get paid to develop something, guess what? You're getting paid to get better. Mm. And you're getting paid to learn. And your next thing will probably be better. Mm -hmm. So the advice I give to everybody is, you're going to suck at pitching first. Everybody's going to suck. Mm -hmm. It's like stand-up. But then the more you do it, the better you get at it. And then if you can figure out how to trick yourself into falling in love with pitching, you will be unstoppable. And pitching becomes second nature to you. And to me, the secret to pitching has always been you're telling somebody, an executive, something you've seen. Mm -hmm. And you're telling them, like you're convincing a friend, oh my God, I went to the movies and I saw this movie, guess what happened? This happened. And then before you knew it, this happened. And then the end, guess what? This happened. You gotta see this movie. That's pitching, right? And we are all pitching ourselves every day to new people you meet, when you're trying to convince somebody to do something. So you can grab all those things and use them to your advantage. At the end of the day, pitching is, hey studio, give me money to make you more money. <laughs> it's not, hey studio, give me money to make my thing. 
Hey, studio, give me money to make a thing that will win awards. Mm -hmm. Hey, give me money to uh, help me further the artistic integrity mm -hmm. of my medium. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, mm -hmm. I mean, we can say stuff like that, but that's not the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is, give me money, and I will give you more money. <laughs> That's right. You should start every pitch with, you guys want to make tons of money? Well, but, 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 but if you say that, they won't yeah, fuck you. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys want to add anything to that in terms of like that secrets or tips for pitching? for? Other yeah. I was reading Brian Cranston's book, and you know, he, it's just a book of his life, you know, from childhood to to being in Breaking Bad and whatnot. And there was this one part, like three three fourths in, where he was talking about auditioning and how bogged down he would get with auditioning. And I forget who who told him. It might have been his manager or somebody. But someone gave him the advice that you're not pitching or you're not you're not auditioning to get the part. When you go into audition, you're putting on a show. You're giving. You're entertaining. You're doing something for somebody else. And in reading that, it was very much like I think that applies to pitching. I think it's very much you go in and you put on a show, you entertain. It's not about, am I gonna get this show made? Is it, is it gonna work? Um, you know, because I think a lot of that bleeds through your words and they can tell like, you know, he's nervous or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of going in and just and telling a story like you're saying, um, I think works a lot better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got, yeah, I got a good one. Um, so me and Jim were uh, having one of our meetings on the tennis court like we do. And uh, we're like... <laughs> we're like well, we still need to play sometime. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure, yeah. yeah we'll do that. We'll have a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like... And, um, I, I, you know, I, I was living in the UK. Jim was in Canada. So we're kind of catching up and stuff. And we were, in, uh, you know, in the process of pitching. Um, I think I had the, a Netflix pitch coming up. And so Jim, we were talking through it and stuff. And... Um, Jim said to me, you know, like, okay, so how are you going to pitch this show? And I was like, all right, so, you know, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to be like, all right, it's this sci-fi, and there's these kids, and they find this, like, um, orb, and it turns out it can teleport them into space. And he's like, I'm already asleep. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, at the end of the day, like, you go in there, and you have your unique idea that you guys have been working on for all this time. But that exec has heard a hundred of these exact ideas. Like at the end of the day, the hundred monkey syndrome, right? It's like yeah. everyone has has had some form of idea like the idea you've had and it's probably connected with Star Wars in some way. And um and so so essentially like you're not going in there to like blow them away with like the most original idea. Jim said the first thing you want to do is connect with them emotionally. So was, we were talking about okay, how do we do that? So okay, so I'll show what it really was about was how the world is going to be fucked in 50 years if we carry on doing what we're doing, right? So that's how we started the pitch. We sat in there and we put a, a, a picture on the wall of like the world on fire. And we said to the guy, like, if, you know, imagine our world in 50 years if we carry on doing what we're doing. And so that was how we started because then they were like, attention, like, yeah, you're right. I'm like, you know, imagine like mass population is like wiped out all the food. Like, you know, there's insane like gap between rich and poor. And that became like the basis of the show. And from that point, when I started pitching it, I could tell the exec was really listening to me because they were like, yeah, this is a, a, something that needs to be tackled. And you guys are, uh, are doing that, you know, hiding it in the theme of your story. So it was like, you know, a, a, few, a rare moment of genius from Jim, but it is, uh, it's really stuck, <laughs> stuck with us. <laughs> He lost at tennis, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Everett, do you want to share anything? Or? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be like a broken record, you know. Like, you guys bring up really great points. I mean, you know, my... <laughs> One of the things I learned, I pitched a lot, you guys. I pitched a lot, um, and I've been pitching for like 14 years, something like that. And um, there's this really, like, I had this really weird thing happening where I was really successful my first pitch, and then I ran into the Hollywood machine, and you see it doesn't matter. Like, everything falls apart. Like, you know, it's like people lined up, and like everyone's talking to you, like, oh, yeah, we're going to, like, you're going to go and develop, and you're going to do this, and then it kind of went away. But that was actually very good for me because I'm like, oh, I see how this cycle sort of works. So um, then when I really started pitching in earnest, I just like bombed a lot. I was just fail failure after failure. So after a certain amount of time, 
like this is gonna sound cynical, but it's not. Trust me, it's not cynical. I didn't really give a shit going into the into the pitches. You know what I mean? Like where I'm like, okay, like, I fuck you guys. Here's my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, like I was confident in the idea, but it's like I kind of went in going like they're not gonna buy it because, and you know what it does? It kind of puts your brain in a different place where it's just like I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna meet some cool people, we're gonna talk about something, and I'm gonna uh, talk about my idea. But when you go in there. They can kind of feel, oh, there's no pressure on this guy. I could talk to him and, like, you know, like, he's, he's loose. Blah, blah, and it becomes a conversation. And those are always a lot more successful. Like, even, the, even in, you know, the pitches that it didn't get bought, like, after that, like, they'd be like, oh, this is a great idea. We're only doing girls' show, tw- you know, 10 to 12. But you know what? Like, hey, you should talk to this guy. They're doing, like, a Ben 10 reboot. Like, that's, that's kind of what happens, and that's what you kind of learn from it. Like, so if you kind of go in there with the idea of, like, you know what, I just want to make a good impression. I want to show them my good ideas, but I also, like, I just kind of want people to, like, you know, get along with me. You know what I mean? To, like, because, you know, here's another thing, again, it always goes back to, like, this big community. You're going to see those guys, like, 5, 10 years, 12 years later. You're going to keep running into them. So you want them to like you. You know what I mean? Like, right. I think you brought up something really important when you were talking about, pitching dad and how it was inspired by your life yes. and being yeah. a dad and being with your kids. I think that's another secret in mm-hmm. pitching that when it's coming from a real place, like mm-hmm. you guys are talking about, yeah. it, you're not only already pitching the show, but you're pitching you yeah. mm-hmm. and you're pitching your connection to the show. So for example, on El Tigre, the pitch was when I grew up in Mexico, my dad was an architect, so he could draw. My grandfather was a general in the army and you know, Mexican army is like Cobra, like, right? Like, they're, they're bad guys. So as a kid, I idolized both of them. And my aunts would grab me by the cheeks and go, Jorge, when you grow up, are you going to be an artist like your dad or are you going to be in the military like your grandfather? El Tigre is about a kid whose dad is a superhero and whose grandpa's a supervillain, and he has to decide what he wants to do. Mm. So when I would pitch that, they would go, he took his personal experience and he made it universal, and he made it thematic, and obviously exaggerated it, but it's coming from a place of truth. Yeah. And that will be the press release, that will be the marketing, that will be when we put you in front of people at a convention. <laughs> and that almost is as important as the actual show. So the story behind the show, especially today, is the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I want to even, yeah, springboard off of that. Like, beyond that, too, like, you'll find that when it's you are coming from that that like honest place it's easier to tell the stories as well like it's easier like you you're getting inspired and like it's you know it's the, I don't know how too. you feel it's yeah. hard right cuz yeah. it's like i'm going to hear this is my heart you can you know like if they reject it you're like fuck you <laughs> <laughs> but, but i mean you get so much more out of it like i mean like literally it wasn't until it's funny you you brought that up cuz it wasn't until i started doing that where i realized it was really connecting and yeah. that's when i really started getting successful was when i made that that connection so. yeah you can kind of see the connection in the people you're pitching to as soon as you're like this is this is how this came to be this is my backstory um and this is how it tied into like this one i'm pitching right now um it's dealing with siblings and the feuding and when you're finally an adult you look back or you look at your time with your siblings now and you're like man i wish i had more time with them and you look back at you know, when you were little, and so it's like, nah, leave me alone, you know, get your own friends. <laughs> and, you know, it's that duality of, man, you know, if only I knew how, how you know, I'm not going to see them a whole lot right now. But you you come in with those types of things, and you can see it click in their heads in the, in the meetings where it's like, oh, yeah, like, I get it. I know what that feels like, you know, and, that, yeah, it's it does help a lot as far as, they know you're bringing some kind of passion, not just oh, this is a this is a turtle and uh, this guy and they, and they fight each other. <laughs> Money, please. Uh, you know, because then you know it's it's just it's just McDonald's food. You know, it's it's not a it's not a real meal. Um, yeah. So adding you know some kind of element, some personal piece of you to it, I think goes a lot 
a long way. Yeah. Oh, I have one quick pro tip. It's a little sneaky, though. If your kids happen to be in the uh, target demographic of the show you're pitching, and you tell a story about your kid and <laughs> make that yeah. connection, they're like, all right. Yeah. Another hot tip is never start your pitch with in a world of. <laughs> <laughs> never. You always start with character, right? Shows are not about worlds. And honestly, shows are not about characters either. Mm -hmm. Shows are about relationships. Mm -hmm. To always start with relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So we have like five minutes left. I want to open the floor. You had your hand up first. Um, I had a question because I know some of you mentioned that you guys do or started off with the comics and just publishing more of a story for the actual pitching of the show. I was just wondering, like, what are the stepping stones from going from a comic or something more written uh, to a show? And how does that work in terms of pitching and the rights being given to the show from a comic book that is all your own? I, th I think really, I mean, in our experience, um, it largely comes down to the fact that when you're going in and pitching, like these guys have said, you're, you're essentially going in and pitching to someone who's assessing how risky this this project is. I've got a mm -hmm. suitcase full of money, mm -hmm. and if I spend it on these guys, am I going to make a return on the money, right? And it's, you know, all of us complain about this a lot, like, you know, creators, that why do they keep revamping old stuff like Scooby-Doo and all this kind of stuff? But at the end of the day, it's less risky because most people see that poster and they're like, I recognize that, so I'm probably going to go and see it. I'll take my kids. You know, it's not ideal for us, right, like kind of indie creators, but at the end of the day, when you're pitching a comic book that already exists, you know, even if it doesn't have a massive audience, it changes the way they perceive that, that, that thing you're pitching because you put it in their hand and you're like, yeah, we've had this published. It's in a couple of, you know, bookstores across the, the states or whatever. They're like, oh, that's less risky. I see this comes with an existing audience. I'm more open to listening to what you're pitching. So really, that for us personally, that that's why the angle worked. It's not the only way to do it. Obviously, there's there's a million ways to pitch, but I think that's why you know making something sometimes is a good move because it just gives. And even if, like I say, it doesn't have to be the most popular comic in the world, but it does give them this sense that you've already created something that's tangible, and now they're essentially, you know, would this work on the big screen? If I could springboard up what you're saying, if I could go back in time and, and tell my ears, I, I'm actually pretty happy with things, way things have progressed. But if I were going to change anything, I'd go back to younger me. And at one point, I was still publishing comic, and then I got to sort of crossroad. I decided, like, do I want to pitch it, or do I want to pitch the comic? And I decided to pitch it, and it's great. It kind of led me here. But that 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 comic is now not really gone anywhere. It's it's. That, that property is still sort of sitting, right? But imagine if you put that time in there, you put it out to the audience, you, you build that audience, that puts you in a so, that puts you in a power position where it's like you own that, right? Like, like you control where it goes. Whereas like if I take it and like I pitch to a studio or whatever, they own that, they own that. Like they can decide where, what direction you want it to go. The other way it's like so much so much more preferable, where where you say like, can we get the movie rights? They don't get everything. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do my publishing. You can get the movie rights or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you want that, like as creators, we want that control. Because a lot of times that control gets taken away from us. Like we're just giving it away because they give us lots of money. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's not. It's just not the same. Like you control so much more if you just publish something. And you know, the, the amount of time I spent like chasing, you know, like pitching and everything. I say 14 years. Around when I would suit that comic, can you imagine if like comic was around 14 years and I was oh, actually yeah. publishing it? Mm -hmm. It'd be a completely different thing. I mm -hmm. might be even be in a better position now than I was if I just, you know, tried to sell it to someone else. You know. Let's uh, do a question on that side. Of... Yeah. To the average point of the studio like accepting original pictures as opposed to like existing IPs, like the trend is a little bit different. That's slippers. Uh, <laughs> That's tricky, man. I'm gonna tell you. You want a real talk? Yeah. Real talk? Or hey, uh, it's it's never been worse for original yeah. ideas. Yeah. We're in an IP we explosion mm. world, mm. and so, so what's happening, especially in live action, is people are backwards engineering their idea to to fit an IP. Yeah. So like Tony Gilroy wants to do something about a revolution. Well, he can he can turn that into Andor. And get right. Star Wars right. to back it. Mm -hmm. So, 
it's almost like, well, I have a vampire movie. All right, so how do I convince that, you know, this is a Blade movie for Marvel? Yeah. Like, that's that's the new thing that's happening now. Like, you don't own it. You don't control it. You're now in the sandbox of the IP. Hmm. And I think video games, is, that's kind it's of, exploding right that's now. Exploding. We're in the, in the video game IP era. Uh, yeah. Honestly, hey. if you were going to do anything now, I think, like, Nobody wants original IP, but I'll tell you right now, that's actually what's going to save a lot of shit right now. Yeah. Is people just sick of, like, all I, the IP? I, that's, 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 that's animation from what I've been accustomed to growing up researching, going to school, hearing from people that are in the industry and now in the industry. Um, it's an up and down. It's always changing. I think that's just where we're at right now, where... You know, I think they bought too many things too fast. They grew too quickly, and then okay, let's stick to safer things. Let's go back to IPs. But it has to come back around. I, I believe it. How it would have to come back around where people, are, like you're saying, are going to get bored of the same IPs and they're going to want newer original stuff again. Mm -hmm. When that is, I don't know. And it was all original, right? Yeah. Star Wars was, was an original IP. Mm -hmm. Adventure Time, mm -hmm. Harry Potter, like they were all original <laughs> IPs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, there becomes a, this thing where like a, a crossroad of like, you know, it's gamble to like to make these things. You spend a lot of money to build it, and they, you want kind of like a built-in insurance. And that's just not, the only thing that guarantees that is, is IP. It's the stuff that's worked before. It's kind of like it's a it's a shortcut, right? Um, but at some point, like it's kind of like it's like an Ouroboros. It's like caving in on itself at this point, you know. But, can you mind if you squeeze in one more? Yeah. Yeah, sure. sure. We'll pull on from the side. Uh, um, so during the talk, it sounds like that there was a lot of science that goes into the movie. Um, what kind of science did you guys learn from that? Um, and how do you balance both working on your own ideas, full time job, and then your relationship with others? Like, it sounds like a lot of you other colleagues, siblings. Um, yeah, because how do you manage to balance all of your ideas? Very poorly. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It's very hard. There was a lot of, you know, dark moments, especially with the pandemic. Uh, the show, we were in the studio for four months, or I think even less than that. Did you do the whole thing? In yeah, we did the whole one and two from Zoom. Um, and you go from, you know, nine hour, 10 hour zoom meetings like consecutively you don't you got like five minutes for a bathroom break sometimes and then you know seven o'clock nine o'clock hits and then you're by yourself you know um that was tough um and then you know trying to add family on top of that and friends on top of that it's it's a it's a tough juggling act to do um it's definitely not easy at all yeah but you know you have people that are backing you that support you that understand um makes it easier mm -hmm. yeah we did our we did our production in the pandemic as well like we had about the same three or four months mm -hmm. before we went into lockdown and yeah those meetings like you just don't understand it's like it's so much when you're in a physical space so much is like oh i can go out and like i had a meeting i walk out of my office i'm like hey what's going on man and i can talk yeah. to him whatever and then i roll in the next meeting when you're at Zoom, you're at the desk. Where else are you going to go? So it's like meeting after meeting after meeting. We were able to target that very early, and, like, we kind of built in a bunch of stuff. Um, but it was still, I mean, it's still a lot, right? Like, mm -hmm. so uh, you got to remember, though, like, it's important. Like, there's a, por there's a part, there was a point in my life when I was, like, working really hard to, like, be successful. And then I had to stop myself. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I have to do the personal stuff because that's literally the fuel. Like, I wouldn't have you know, have these great ideas if I didn't build these amazing relationships with my family and the friends and like that, like the art inspires, so our life inspires the art, right? So you got to do the lifestyle part if you want to get good and good at the art. So one, one last thing. I mean, this is a creators panel. We're all creators. I'm assuming a lot of you guys want to be creators. This is absolutely the best time it's ever been mm. to pitch and create your own show. There's never been more stuff being consumed in the world, video games, shorts, series, movies. It's happening, adult animation, it's happening. It's, this is the time. Right now it might seem like it, the clouds are really dark, <laughs> and they are, <laughs> but the storm will pass. Mm -hmm. And so if you guys are pitching now, 
you'll be even more ready when those clouds pass. So do not be discouraged by the stuff you're reading on Twitter. They need to make stuff. Yeah. The, the machine of Hollywood needs new blood. And you guys, <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, there's a price to be paid to make these things. It's completely worth it, I would say. <laughs> but this is a critical moment for creators. You got to keep pitching. You can't get discouraged. You don't have time. You make the time. You figure out when to do it on the weekends and at night. Mm -hmm. Every one of us, every creator you guys have ever seen, every show you love, none of them were easy. No one stumbles out of their mother's vagina and is given a show. <laughs> like, that's not how this works. You earn it. So, you guys. Apart from Michael Bay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I take that back. Yeah, asterisk. <laughs> but this, the, the power of creation, this is such a cliche, but it's so true. The power of creation is coming from us and you. And if the studios could do it without us, Fucking, they would do it without us, mm -hmm. but they, they can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hone it, study it, look at shows, look at the credits and go, all right, where did those people go afterwards? Yeah. Oh my God, the guy who did SpongeBob was on Rocco's Modern Life. Oh my God, Alex Hirsch was on Fish Hook. Like, you can, it's all, all the information's out there. Yeah, I, I read, I don't know how many art of books, just researching how others got their start, how they ran their productions, how all these XYZs going through websites, um, Ed Capnell's book, uh, Bob Iger's book, just you can't wait for people to teach. You can't wait for people to tell you now you can pitch. Um, you got to put in the work. You have to, like you were saying, that's after work, that's on the weekends, you know. You you got to put in the effort. It's it's not easy, um, but, it's but you got to do it. If yeah. you, if you're serious about it and you're passionate, you actually believe in the story that you're 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 putting out there to pitch. If you truly believe that thing will work, you got to put in the effort. Mm -hmm. There's no other way. You got to put in the effort. Um, there's just there's one thing I I find for me that maybe the would be helpful, but um, if it was just me sitting in my room coming up with ideas for shows, there would be nothing because I would never get anything done. So for me, it's been like if I team up with people and now I'm accountable and I have to hit dates and I have to hit deadlines and I have to do this by this time, then stuff gets done. Yeah. So yeah. that that's just something that's helped me out. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. people can do that. I am not one of those people. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you guys again so much for such an. Oh, Andy, thank you. Thank I want you. to say one last thing. Oh, one last thing. One last thing. What you have to do is like if you pursue these ideas on in your own time. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create a sense of FOMO with these people. <laughs> I'm right. uh, being absolutely right. serious. Like, you're showing them that this is getting done, whether mm -hmm. they're involved mm -hmm. or not, mm -hmm. and do they want to miss out on it? A mm -hmm. lot of things, like, things have appeared because they don't want to get embarrassed because of oh, this person blows up, and, well, it's still going. This guy's still doing that. If he blows up, and they know that he talked in my office, and I pass on it. You know what I mean? Like, you got to let them know, like, this is going to get done whether you're going to help me or not, you know? And they, that determination impresses them, too. So that's my last bit. That's a great way to end it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys.